Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Bodang damang sanghang namasami Before I start with the reading just to uh, make a few comments about the readings that have already happened, just that a lot of them have been about relinquishing sensuality and the any sort of uh, coarse pleasure of sensuality, and we can hear these teachings and we can leave leave them feeling totally horrible, feeling like we're hopeless, hopeless people, can't give up sensuality, sensuality still in the mind, sensual thoughts, and so on. And I think it's good to remember that um, it's not, it's not saying like it's bad or judging it, but getting in, getting out of that kind of Judeo-Christian conditioning where we're, we're always blaming and judging ourselves, but rather seeing what's the cause of suffering and what's the cause of well-being. So like, so this is like the contemplative life, looking, contemplating what actually leads to long-term well-being and uh, what, what leads to more suffering. So, uh, that can help us in terms of coming back to a more of a non-personal sense of sensuality rather than uh, saying, oh, I've got all these sensual thoughts and kind of judging and condemning ourselves. And it, it's very important in the practice to actually break ourselves out of that conditioning, which is very much a part of our culture. So I was, I was, what comes to mind is... Uh, when, I think we were. I think you were there as well. We were talking with Ajahn Jai Saro, because <clears throat> they're uh, translating the 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 uh, like stillness flowing back oh, yeah. into Thai, yeah. and uh, they're having a really difficult. There, there's there's uh, the, the, there's a term that Ajahn Jai Saro used to describe the kind of the Thai Lao temperament, it's this uncomplicated sensuality. And it was sort of like it was so it was so obvious in the Thai language, you know, that you like it <laughs> that it was hard to to uh, to to like you almost had to describe how complicated yeah. somebody in the English language makes sensuality. <laughs> and, and, and it was just uh, uh, so they were they were having trouble translating it into right. into Thai. Right. <coughs> I think none of us could come up with anything either. Right. <laughs> he was trying. He couldn't come up with anything, and nobody else could either. <laughs> so this is continuing on on page eight hundred six, page eight hundred sixty, of Buddha Dhamma, uh, right where Ajahn Karunama left off. Both the teachings on noble growth and on the four bases of social solidarity pertain to a refined form of sensual happiness, which acts as a link between material benefit and spiritual benefit. I think that's a very important point, just to reiterate that a refined form of sensual happiness, which acts as a link between material benefit and spiritual benefit. So it's like different higher level refinements and gradations of happiness that can start to actually be of benefit. In shorter teachings by the Buddha, however, material benefit or present benefit usually refers to material wealth because economic factors are of such central importance to the life of householders and they incorporate almost all facets of a layperson's life. When looking at only these select suttas, it is thus easy to get the impression that present benefit refers exclusively to material wealth. Below are some additional teachings by the Buddha on present benefit. Some of these emphasize material wealth, while others act as a bridge to realizing spiritual benefit. To begin with, however, let us look at a sutta in which present benefit refers to another aspect of sense pleasure not tied up with material wealth. Here, the emphasis is on attending to one's physical health.
And this is the Donapaka Sutta. The Buddha was reciting at Savati. On that occasion, King Pasenadi of Kosala had eaten a pot measure of rice with delicacies. Then when he had finished eating, cramped and discomforted, the king approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. Then the Blessed One, having understood that King Pasenadi had eaten and was cramped and discomforted, on that occasion recited this verse. When a man is always mindful, knowing moderation in the food he eats, his ailments duly diminish, he ages slowly, and he lives long. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin youth Sudasana was standing behind King Pasenadi of Kosala. I like that image of this sutta, like King Pasenadi goes and pays, pays homage to the Blessed One, but he just doesn't even say anything. He just sits down and is, is uncomfortable. The king addressed the Brahmin youth Sudasana, come now, dear Sudasana, learn this verse from the Blessed One and recite it to me whenever I am taking my meal. I will then present you daily with a hundred kahapanas as a cost for the meal. Yes, sire, the Brahmin youth Sudasana replied. Having learned this verse from the Blessed One, whenever King Pasenadi was taking his meal, the Brahmin youth Sudasana recited it. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala gradually restrained himself until his intake of food was at most a small pot measure of boiled rice. At a later time, when his body had become energetic and spry, King Pasenadi of Kosala stroked his limbs with his hand and on that occasion uttered this inspired utterance. The Blessed One showed compassion toward me in regard to both kinds of good, the present good and the higher good. <clears throat> The following sutta on present benefit describes a proper engagement with sense pleasure and emphasizes the relationship to material wealth, but it too provides a link to a higher spiritual benefit. Note that this sutta was given to the wealthy merchant Anattapindika, who was a stream enterer. Note also that in regard to the first three kinds of happiness below, the term clansman is used, while in regard to the fourth kind of happiness, the term noble disciple is used indicating a rise to a higher spiritual benefit. And this is uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya, but the, the reference, it doesn't say the sutta, sutta number here. <clears throat> then the householder Anattapindika approached the blessed, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. The blessed one said to him, Householder, there are these four kinds of happiness that may be regularly achieved by a layperson who enjoys sensual pleasures. What for? The happiness of owning wealth, the happiness of spending wealth for consumption, the happiness of freedom from debt, and the happiness of blameless actions. And what householder is the happiness of ownership? Here, a clansman has acquired wealth by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteous wealth righteously gained. When he thinks, I have acquired this wealth by energetic striving, righteously gained, he experiences happiness and joy. This is called the happiness of ownership. And what is the happiness of consumption? Here, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteous wealth righteously gained, a clansman enjoys his wealth and does meritorious deeds. When he thinks, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, righteously gained, I enjoy my wealth and do meritorious deeds. He experiences happiness and joy. This is called the happiness of consumption. And what is the happiness of freedom from debt? Here a clansman has no debts to anyone, whether large or small. When he thinks, I have no debts to anyone, whether large or small, he experiences happiness and joy. This is called the happiness of freedom from debt. And what is the happiness of blamelessness? Here, householder, a noble disciple, is endowed with blameless bodily, verbal, and mental action. When he thinks, I am endowed with blameless bodily, verbal, and mental action, he experiences happiness and joy. This is called the happiness of blamelessness. And there's verses. Having realized the happiness of freedom from debt, one should recall the happiness of ownership. While spending one's wealth, one sees clearly the happiness of material wealth. 
When seeing things clearly, the wise one knows both kinds of happiness and sees that the other three are not worth a sixteenth part of the bliss of blamelessness. <clears throat> the, the following sutta makes a clear distinction between present benefit and spiritual benefit the latter acting as both a support and a constraint for the former. And this is Ankutra 4, 281. I'll read the whole sutta. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Kolians near the Kolian town named Kakarapata. There, the young Kolian Digajanu approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said, Venerable Sir, we are laymen enjoying sensual pleasures, living at home in a house full of children. We use sandalwood from Kasi. We wear garlands, scents, and unguents. We welcome gold and silver. Let the Blessed One teach us the Dhamma in a way that will lead to our welfare and happiness in this present life and in the future. There are Biaga Paja, these four things that lead to the welfare and happiness of a clansman in this present life. What for? Accomplishment and diligence, accomplishment and protection, good friendship, and balanced living. And what is accomplishment and diligence? Here, whatever may be the means by which a clansman earns his living, whether by farming, trade, raising cattle, military service, government service, or some other craft, he is skillful and diligent. He possesses sound judgment in order to carry out and arrange it properly. This is called accomplishment in diligence. And what is accomplishment in protection? Here a clansman sets up protection and guard over the wealth he has acquired through perseverance, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteous wealth righteously gained, thinking, how can I prevent kings from confiscating it, thieves from stealing it, fire from burning it, floods from sweeping it off, and displeasing, displeasing hairs from squandering it. This is called accomplishment in protection. And what is good friendship? Here in whatever village or town a clansman lives, he associates with householders or their sons, both young and old, who are of mature conduct, who are endowed with faith, virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom. He converses with them and consults with them. Insofar as they are accomplished in faith, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in faith. In so far as they are accomplished in virtuous behavior, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in virtuous behavior. In so far as they are accomplished in generosity, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in generosity. In so far as they are accomplished in wisdom, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in wisdom. This is called good friendship. And what is balanced living? Here a clansman leads a balanced life, living neither too extravagantly nor too frugally. He knows the way his wealth increases and declines, aware, in this way my income will exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. Just as an appraiser or his apprentice, holding up a scale, knows, by so much it has dipped down, by so much it has gone up. If this clansman has a small income but lives luxuriously, Others would say of him, this clansman eats his wealth just like an eater of figs. There's a note here. Uh, an eater of figs is a colloquial expression. It refers to one wishing to eat figs might shake a ripe fig tree and with one effort knock down many fruits. He would eat the ripe fruits and depart, leaving behind the rest. Just so one who spends the greater part of his earnings enjoys his wealth by dissipating it, so it is said, this clansman eats his wealth just like an eater of figs. And if he has a large income but lives austerely, others would say of him, this clansman may even die as a pauper. But it is called balanced living when a clansman leads a balanced life. See here, Pyagapaja. The wealth thus righteously gained has four pathways to ruin. Womanizing, drunkenness, gambling, and bad friendship, bad companionship, bad comradeship. 
just as if there were a large reservoir with four inlets and four outlets, and a man would close the inlets and open the outlets, and sufficient rain does not fall, one could expect the water in the reservoir to decrease rather than increase. The wealth thus righteously acquired has four pathways to gain. One avoids womanizing, drunkenness, and gambling. One cultivates good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship, just as if there were a large reservoir with four inlets and four outlets, and a man would open the inlets and close the outlets, and sufficient rain falls, one could expect the water in the reservoir to increase rather than decrease. These are the four things that lead to the welfare and happiness of a clansman in this very life. There are, Bhyaga Paja, these four things that lead to the welfare and happiness of a clansman in the future. What for? Accomplishment in faith, accomplishment in virtuous behavior, accomplishment in generosity, and accomplishment in wisdom. And what is accomplishment in faith? Here, a clansman is endowed with faith. He places faith in the awakening of the Tathagata thus. The blessed one is an arahant, the enlightened one, the exalted one. This is called accomplishment in faith. And what is accomplishment in virtuous conduct? Here a clansman abstains from the destruction of life, the five precepts, from intoxicants, that is, spirits and alcoholic beverages, which are the basis for heedlessness. This is called accomplishment in virtuous conduct. And what is accomplishment in generosity? Here a clansman dwells at home with a heart devoid of the stain of miserliness, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, one devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. This is called accomplishment in generosity. And what is accomplishment in wisdom? Here a clansman is wise. He possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. This is called accomplishment in wisdom. See here, Bhyaga Paja. These are the four things that lead to the welfare and happiness of a clansman in the future. Ends in verses. Enterprising in his occupations, heedful in his management, balanced in his way of living, he safeguards the wealth he earns. Endowed with faith, accomplished in virtue, charitable and devoid of miserliness, he constantly purifies the path that leads to safety in the future. Thus, these eight qualities of the faithful householder are said by the truthful one to lead to happiness in both ways, to good and welfare in this very life, and to happiness in the future. Thus, for those dwelling at home, their generosity and merit increase. Although still enjoying sense pleasures, when lay people are able to engage with this enjoyment in a way that generates present benefits, and they gain a familiarity with experience with more refined spiritual benefits, it can be expected that they will prosper and experience a reliable, harmless form of happiness. Moreover, they will help to generate lasting social well-being and prosperity. And I'll just uh, read one more page, this section. The next section is called Comparison of Different Kinds of Happiness. <clears throat> when compared with more refined kinds of happiness, it is normal that sense pleasure will be reduced in value. In comparison to the happiness of jhana, for example, sense pleasure is described as ordinary happiness, patujana sukha, the happiness of unawakened people, or contaminated happiness, milhasukha, and inferior happiness. Furthermore, it is described as consisting of suffering, affliction, and obstruction, and constituting the wrong way of practice, micha patipada. In contrast, the happiness of jhana, or internal happiness, is described as happiness free from sensuality, happiness based on seclusion, happiness conducive to peace, and happiness conducive to awakening. It is free from suffering, distress, and affliction, and it constitutes correct spiritual practice, sama patipada, 
which leads to liberation, to Nibbana. Although the Buddha frequently denigrates and points out the dangers of sense pleasure, this does not mean that he was set on condemning or despising it. From one perspective, the Buddha was simply trying to point out the truth behind sense pleasure. Ordinary people, however, who are often ensnared by mental defilements, often view his teachings as excessively severe. Moreover, by comparing sensual happiness cherished by most people with a more refined form of happiness, he devalued the former in order to elevate the latter. Most importantly, however, sense pleasure is an unyielding and tenacious snare in which most people are caught up and from which it is difficult to escape. The Buddha thus heavily criticized sense pleasure along with praising more refined forms of happiness in order to urge people to make haste in their spiritual practice, to avoid complacency, and to experience supreme happiness. Not all people who realize more refined kinds of happiness immediately abandon sensual pleasures. Many people continue to live their lives by enjoying both kinds or both levels of happiness. In these circumstances, such people have more options or have a greater advantage in regard to experiencing happiness. In sum, the Buddha emphasized heedfulness and an awareness that, whether one abandons sensual pleasure or not, it is imperative to realize more refined forms of happiness within oneself and to develop these until one reaches supreme happiness. So I'll, I'll leave the reading there, and uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, expositions. find the householder life kind of a balancing act, you know, especially with uh, knowing this, this information and um, just tamping down, well, trying to understand it's not too sensual and not too, too uh, going in either direction. It's, it's a balancing act. <clears throat> I think he tied it together at the end to kind of what I was saying in the beginning, like, that we hear these teachings and we might take like, we might think it's quite severe, so like take a very sort of self-condemnation, but it's more like the Buddha's trying to drive the point home that there is this more refined type yeah. of happiness which is more desirable. And I, I um, try to watch myself in, in judging when I see other people that are maybe overweight or something. That's another pitfall. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it seems, seems to me like, you know, when we have those choices and options more so in, in the household life, then you just, you know, start to, uh, a good thing to do is just to start to use your, your discernment more and more, you know, to say, okay, you know, how does this feel when I do this, you know, and if there's something that seems like it's not producing useful, wholesome, good results, then you know from your own experience how you want to, Okay, well maybe I'll let that one go, or no, it's, it's still something that seems good to do and, and supportive, you know, and you know is harmless. So I think I'll continue that. But just to use your own wisdom to say, where am I at right now? This what do I want to let go? What do I want to just you know continue with for the time being? Um, and decide for yourself at what point you want to take any more steps if you want to. It's important to notice over time is like the way the defilements are is like this idea of when you cut out sensuality then you might become more judgmental and then you like look at your judgmental and the sensuality come back. This idea of how the self manifests <coughs> continually move around mm -hmm. and whenever you're not feeding one another one will pop up mm -hmm. and uh, keep having it. It's like whack-a-mole. Knock them down. Eventually come up less and less. That's the good news. I 
think also making the point that it, it's uh, it's hard to see the higher happiness because it's it's not the happiness that's higher than sensuality is not a happiness in terms of like amplitude or quantity, but it's like a refinement. It's a more subtle, refined, peaceful form of happiness. So it's it's actually hard to see. Like I think we might actually experience it sometimes, but not realize it or not not see it, not not, no, not notice it because it's too refined. Yeah, because there's so that sort of appreciation right? is is one like like turning attention to appreciation because that's where so like like even the. Uh, like mudita is is so overlooked as a as a brahma vihara because sort of just one is appreciating um, either the happiness well being success uh, of others in the similar when even in our own experience it's so easy to 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 skip over appreciation of something that is maybe not as not got as much zip as 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 other things.